Thank you for joining DevOps for Java Developers at JCConf Taiwan 2022. I'm a software developer, and this is my entire world. This is what I do on my free time. This is what keeps me going, and this is where I feel the most successful. And I do love to share knowledge with other developers. My main drive is putting humanity back into software development because I believe that we are humans writing code for humans to improve human life. Uh, we spend most of our time reading code written by others than writing our own code. So, hi, my name is Ixchel Rees. I'm from Mexico. I live in Switzerland. I work for JFrog. I'm a Java champion. I have collaborated in some books. I'm part of several organizations that support the standards and open source. This is the latest book I collaborated on. And so let's start. DevOps in Java. Let's start with the DevOps part. I want to present you the 2021 State of DevOps Report. This was created by Puppet. And regardless how we define DevOps, thousands of teams now implement this, this methodology. Now we have the ability to deploy software more safely and more quickly. We have moved from being able to deploy software only a couple of times a year to on-demand delivery with faster remediation times and significantly improved collaboration across functions. Since 2013, when the State of DevOps report had already established a relationship between a true DevOps practice, the combination of people, practice, and culture, and high-performance outcomes, organizations practicing DevOps consistently report more frequent deployments, shorter lead time to change, lower change failure rates, and faster mean time to recover. These four metrics do not encompass all of the DevOps, but they illustrate the measurable concrete benefits of pairing engineering exper expertise with a focus on minimizing friction across the entire software lifecycle. They also have a direct impact on business outcome. Organizations that can deploy on demand and have shorter lead time to change create comparative advantages by delivering solutions to their customers faster. Shorter mean times to recover and lower chain failure rates create more stable systems. And there are good news. For example, in this report published in 2018 at the EAAA software by Barry Snyder from Fannie Mae, he describes the amazing journey that Fannie Mae undertook during its DevOps transformation. This transformation was motivated by Fannie Mae's need to adjust its IT capabilities to meet the requirements and pace of rapidly evolving mortgage markets. In 2012, Fannie Mae had only 10 teams using Agile-like techniques. Releases took 9 to 18 months, provisioning of environments took 2 to 4 months, and quality was not consistently measured. Fannie Mae's IT department was a complex technical polyglot ecosystem composed of 461 applications, several hundred utilities, and almost 18,000 open source components. The Agile DevOps transformation allowed Fannie Mae to create an internal software supply chain with automated handoff between functions to reduce delays. Teams performing frequent scans coupled with the full a spectrum of agile DevOps technologies and practices average a 30 to 48 improvement in total quality index, while outliners as high as 70%. An average of 28% productivity gains was achieved by teams that implemented repeatable agile practices, automated structural quality analysis, test automation, 
and consistent use of DevOps platform for continuous integration and delivery. In comparison to 2012, Fannie Mae achieved 21 times more than 19,000 more bills per month without the previous staffing while improving quality. So this is the reason why DevOps is so much looked after. So now let's talk about Java. What about Java? How are we there? What do we need? What are our challenges? Okay, so when we build software and any kind, framework, libraries, packages, and models, we know that that involves an iterative process, development, operation, and runtime or execution. And we need to increase the number of feedback loops between these phases and bring important concerns early in the development process. So if we are already uh, thinking about an agile process or a DevOps process, we know that we can consistently improve the quality of software that we are building while trying to release more valuable features in each release version. Releasing a new version, it's a routine operation where a consistent process can be followed. So I hope that at this point in time, you have already heard about DevOps, DevSecOps, and Ship Left. And if, I mean, if you have, or your organization has already embraced it, you know that there are a lot of benefits to be gained from. But if you still not sure about what is DevOps, I will go in a very brief story history about it. So DevOps started, can be traced back to 2007, when IT operation and software development communities raised concerns that they felt was a fatal level of dysfunction between these two groups in the industry. There is a book that I recommend you to read because it's very entertaining that describes the story in a kind of, a, no, it's actually a novel about how the entire concept of DevOps was created and established in a, in a fictitious company. So DevOps is mostly about a cultural change where the aim is to increase transparency, communication, and collaboration between cross teams, uh, share more responsibilities between the development team and the operations teams. So the, the development team, if they build the software, they should be able to run it. And with this, with this sharing of responsibilities, we can make decisions faster and easier. And if there is some problem between the building and running, we have this feedback as fast as possible. And we can increase then, obviously, the performance and stability. And most of the times, we will have more automation around our entire process. DevSecOps. What is DevSecOps? Well, DevSecOps is just bringing security early into the process. And what does that actually mean? Well, there are several um, scans or tools and at different levels that we can leverage or we should be using in our software development life cycle. So for example, the static application security testing. Uh, so it is about all those tools that scan the source code for known weakness and insecure coding practices, code smells. Software composition analysis is analyze software to detect known software components, such as open source and third-party libraries, and identify and associate vulnerabilities. SCA complements ASST by finding vulnerabilities not detectable by a scanning source code. Dynamic application security testing scans applications in runtime. This enables an outside-in approach to testing applications for exploitable conditions that were not detectable in a static state. The web application firewalls monitor traffic at the application level and 
detect potential attacks and attempts to exploit vulnerabilities. Container image scanning tools can continuously and automatically scan containers with the CICD pipeline and in-container registry. Cloud security posture management solutions identify misconfigurations in cloud infrastructure. Finally, shift left. Shift left is just bringing testing and security measures into code development process early on, closer to the developers. So testing and security. But before we move into these two big concepts, uh, there is a high probability that you have already thought about using microservices. And microservices have been quickly adopted in the last decade, almost becoming the default style for building enterprise applications. Or at least we all have been tempted to migrate our existing monolithic applications to microservices. Martin Fowler once described microservices as an approach to developing a single application as a suite of small services, each running its own process and communicating with lightweight mechanisms, built around business capabilities and independently deployable by fully automated deployment, deployment machinery. Maybe with a bare minimum of centralized management of the services. And this is the key part. And they may be written in different programming languages. So every single microservice can be thought as entire, completely different project with its own life cycle, versioning, release process. So the challenges that we have as a software developers, for example, improving the quality of software that we're building and releasing more valuable features in every single release are multiplied. From requirement specification, documentation, architecture, testing, security, automation, to cross-team collaboration micro, mini, or small services, potentially written in different languages, evolving at different rates as a whole different products that can have different levels of dependency with each other. We're changing API contracts. So we actually need tools that help us to bring security and testing, more testing, early on into our development process. So in the security arena, I want you to take a look at three particular uh, tools that I'm very, very happy to show to you. The first one is Frogbot. Frogbot is a kitbot that will actually scan your source code and suggest you uh, if, if there is a known vulnerability in one specific version of your dependencies, it will suggest you create its own pull request or just generate you a report about what are the risks associated with that specific pull request. So there are two advantages. When there is a pull request opened, uh, both the author of the pull request will receive the information about the vulnerabilities found in that particular piece of code, uh, or when even if you merge it completely into your project, even with that warning, later on it will try to create a pull request. Well, it will create a pull request where it suggests you a different version where it has been solved. And the report that is created is like that. If there is nothing there, it will be completely green. And if there is a problem, it will be red. And it will actually show you the version, the component, if there was a fixed version, the severity. Now, you will be thinking about there are other tools out there that do something similar. And you're right. Something similar is the keyword. Because one of the things that I like to point out here is that uh, 
when you're using Frogbot with your even your free tier uh, JFrog platform, you can define watches. And what is a watch? It's a series of policies that can filter what are the result of these reports. So why do I like that? Because if we receive a report with thousands, hundreds, or I don't know how many vulnerabilities advisories, then it's too much. It's too much. At some point, we need to define a priority because every single one of these advisories should be solved. But which one? How many? How long should we invest in this? Is this a blocker? No. So by providing watches, the developer can have a curated list that is aligned with your organization policy to solve problems. So that is the big difference for me. The other big difference is that if you are already a client of Artifactory and X-Ray, well, you also have access to more uh, extended information from our security teams. And they, are tell, uh, and they are working really hard into creating and defining new vulnerabilities as fast as possible, and also creating reports, not only by saying you that there is a critical uh, vulnerability, but also telling you how difficult or how easy or how probable this particular vulnerability will be exploited. So that is more information to make your decisions into fixing or, or adopting a different policy to the security of your project. The other one is that if you're already using Docker images, then there is the Docker desktop extension where you can load your your uh, Docker images and you will have the same information, almost the same. Um, it actually goes really deep into the different layers of the Docker image and also the zip files really goes deep into analyzing the vulnerabilities of what is in your Docker image. So. And this is also one of my favorites because we saw with Frogbot what happens when you are already in your GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. But what happens if you're running locally in your own development environment? Well, you have your IDs of your choice. In this case, I usually use IDEA. So I have the IDEA uh, JFrog plugin, which is showing you uh, the exact same information, like it's analyzing your, for example, in this case, this is a Maven project and I added a known vulnerability and it's telling me what is the vulnerability that it's found and with what severity, what is the version, what are the components that are being affected and even if there is a fixed version. So I can already change it at development time. And if we already have uh, adopted the microservice architecture style in the Java world, and we have actually, we have a lot of options, a lot of tools that can help, help us in that a new adventure. So for example, there is Quarkus, Micronaut, Microprofile, Spring, Helidon, many, many, uh, many, many options of wizard. And I'm happy to say that we are, Java is one of the most mature ecosystems and more mature development platforms. So when we are talking about testing, uh, we have very good testing libraries that we can use. And I want to showcase you my favorite, favorite ones. For example, Wiremock. Wiremock is a simulator for HTTP-based APIs. So it can run in a standalone process without the HTTP server. So for example, in Docker, it can proxy selectively proxy requests through the other host. Matching criteria can be used. There is this record and replay. And what I love about it is the simulating faults. 
and also stateful behavior. So in version 2, 3, uh, 2, uh, 32, um, that was released last December, the team introduced the ability to run Wearmog without needing an HTTP server for a serverless deployment model. It was already possible to do this using Wearmog app, which relies on internal APIs, which will be, uh, well, well, they will break when we move to Java modules. So in this new version, you can do it in a more proper way. And the other thing that I love about Wormog is that you can use it programmatically in Java, or you can use curl to create your own endpoints. And as I said, you can simulate faults, uh, random timeouts, different errors. Uh, it's, it's incredible how flexible, how powerful, and how useful it is. The next um, library that I want to show you is Rest Assure. Rest Assure is a Java DSL for simplifying testing of REST. You can specify request data, path parameters, cookies, header, multi-value parameters, verify the response data with cookies, status, body content matching, Measuring response times, authentication, it supports OAuth 1, OAuth 2, and it has even very good Spring support. The version 4.5.1 was released in February 11, 2021, last year. And in the version 4.5.0, they upgraded Groovy from 3.0.8 to 3.0.9. So if you have used uh, Groovy before, you know, like working with XML and REST, is trivial. So your test cases will be very, very concise, very easily to maintain, and very readable. So I love it. My One of my favorite, favorite tools so far is test containers. So test containers is a Java library that supports JUnit tests providing lightweight, throwaway instance of common database, Selenium web browsers, or anything else that can run in a Docker container. Anything else. So before test containers came into my life, I used to use Docker Compose during tests. So I create my Docker Compose and I start my test. Well, that was kind of okay because I need to export some of the ports, I need to um, pass the names and things like that. And when they died, sometimes I got zombie uh, containers. So that's bad. The zombie containers are totally bad because they are consuming resources of my machine. The other thing is by exposing uh, ports, the problem is that running them, this test in CI-CD environment, it's impossible because you have conflict, uh, conflicting ports. So when test containers came in, I completely forgot about this. Test containers will take care of starting the different services that I have defined. Not only that, it will check, it has help checks to know when to start running my tests instead of a start like a, a trivial a sleep, try again, a sleep, try again. Are you okay, my database, my, my sweet, sweet database? So they are already taking care of that. They, you can actually ask the container that was started, what is your port? What is your user? What is your password? So nothing of that is either exposed, hard-coded, or, uh, or you will never have this kind of conflicts. So version 163 was released on January 2022. And what is interesting about this particular release, that it is that it introduced K3S modules. So this is for helping us test Kubernetes components, uh, Kubernetes controllers operators that, who needed something more than just a mock Kubernetes API. In this release, they bring the, the K3As module to spin up the K3As lightweight Kubernetes inside of a container. 
So we have talked about my favorite rituals to increase our our return of investment in test and make them fast, concise, easy to maintain, expressive, with really powerful tools. But there is a problem. There is still a problem. Even if we have a healthy number of unit integration contract, that is consumer and provider tests, UI end-to-end, -end, REST API, acceptance and exploratory tests, we still control and well-defined world by our imagination and assumptions. So our imagination and our assumptions are our limits. And out there in production, things can be totally different. And this is an amazing problem how, where, what, how long, how fast is defined by our imagination, belief, and technical capabilities and assumptions. And sometimes we are totally, totally wrong. So the other alternative is to test in production. I know, sounds so wrong. We should say, observe closely our services in production and understand better the system state using a predefined set of metrics and logs. Monitoring application let us detect failure. So monitoring is crucial for analyzing long-term trends, providing information on how the services are growing and how they're being utilized. On the other hand, observability, which originated from control theory, measures how well you can understand a system internal state from its external outputs. Observability uses instrumentation to provide insights that aid monitoring. An observable system allows to understand and measure the internals, finding easily and figure out the cause from the effects. So observability has three pillars. Traces. Traces track the progression of a single request, called a trace, and it is handled by services that make up an application. A request may be initiated by a user on an application. Distributed tracing is a form of tracing that transverse processes, network, and security boundaries. A trace is a tree of a span. What is in a span? Each unit of work is a, in a trace is called a span. A spans are objects that represent the work being done by individual services or component as it flows through a system. The second pillar, metrics. Metrics is a metric on, it's just a measurement about a service. Capture a runtime, snapshot. Logically, the moment of capturing one of these measurements is known as a metric event, which consists not only of the measurement in itself, but the time that it was captured and associated data. This, the third pillar, locks, it was, it is the most mature. We have been using it for far, for, for so long. And this is only a time stat text record, either a structure, which is recommended, or in structure with metadata. While logs are an independent data source, they may also be attached to spans. So again, a section of tools. As I said in the introduction, I believe in open source and promoting standards in the industry. I will most of the time join efforts that foster and sustain an ecosystem of open source projects or tools that implement standards. That's why let's talk about the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF. The CNCF uh, seeks to drive adoption 
of technologies and techniques by fostering and sustaining an ecosystem of open source vendor neutral projects. Uh, the technologies that they are proposing are for building and running a scalable application in modern dynamic environments such as public, private, and hybrid clouds. Containers, service meshes, microservices, immutable infrastructures, and declarative APIs. And the techniques that they are focusing are to enable loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable with robust automation to allow engineers to make high impact changes frequently and predictable with minimal tool. So I strongly suggest to go to the CNCF and look at their different uh, landscape of projects. And you're probably already using one of their most successful projects, Kubernetes. Kubernetes was the first uh, project that graduated from the CNCF. So Kubernetes is part of the schedule and orchestration landscape of the CNCF. So when you go into the CNCF, uh, you can go into the different cards and it will tell you what is the project the repository, information about the, uh, the language it was written, and how much lines of code, et cetera, et cetera. So in the landscape of observability, in the category of observability and analysis, you can find all this. Probably you identify uh, open metrics and Prometheus. Prometheus, it's almost the de facto standard but there are other options, as you can see, um, even the, the gray ones and the clear ones, the clear ones are open source and the gray ones are vendor specific options. And for example, in tracing, you can find Jogger, Zipkin or open telemetry. And in the logging, uh, part you can find, for example, Fluent D, but I suggest you you have a Grafana look at the Grafana Loki because it's what Prometheus is for monitoring, Loki is for logging. So again, uh, Prometheus, Prometheus is an open source monitoring system. Uh, it was developed back in two two in two thousand and twelve by SoundClouds. And it was the second project accepted into the, the CNCF after Kubernetes, and also the second to graduate. And it, it includes a rich multidimensional data model, a concise and powerful query language called PromQL, an efficient embedded time series database, and over 150 integration with third-party systems. And that, the amount of integration is what has made it so, so successful. People sometimes talked about the Prometheus in a negative way. And one of the reasons is because cardinality sometimes is a problem. So the performance with Prometheus always comes down to two things, label and cardinality. If you have high cardinality labels, this means labels with big numbers of unique values, that is not dangerous on their own. The danger is the total number of active series. So keep in mind cardinality when you are using Prometheus and you are um, thinking about um, the performance. The other thing that I urge you to start having a look right now it's open metrics this is an open standard for transmitting cloud native metrics at scale it acts as an open standard for prometheus actually it was extracted from prometheus and created within the cncf in 2017 and right now it already has published the stable the version one zero uh, one zero of its specification 
And it's already used by large enterprises, for example, GitLab, DoorDash, Grafana Labs. Open metrics is primarily a wire format, independent of any particular transfer for that format. The format is expected to be consumed on a regular basis and to be meaningful over success, su successive, success, yeah, uh, frequent expositions. This standard expresses all system states as numerical values counts, current values, enumeration, and Boolean states. Singular events occur in specific times. Metrics tend to aggregate data temporally. The other one is open telemetry. It, this is more than just a new way to visualize data across application. This project aims to change how we use instrumentation without requiring a change in monitoring tools. It's a collection of tools and features designed to measure software performance. It's the amalgamation of two open source projects that were already there, Open Tracing and Open Census. Open Tracing, it, it was developed by the CNCF to provide a vendor agnostic standardized API for tracing. And Open Census was an internal traceability platform from Google that later evolved into an open source standard. So Open Telemetry, even though it's an incubating project, combines already the strengths of both of these standards to form a unified traceability standard that's both vendor and platform agnostic. It's now available for use across various platforms and environments. It provides APIs and SDKs, among other tools, to measure and collect telemetry data for distributed and cloud-native applications and allow exporting the data to other visualization tools. So for example, if you were already using some of the libraries from Google that had open census, they are already migrating to open telemetry. So if you were already doing this, please do migrate to open telemetry. Now, if you go and see the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and see all its landscape, all the projects and the libraries and the tools that you can use for your uh, Cloud Native adventure, this is what you would find. It's daunting, isn't it? I always get the question about, what should I use? What, what, what should I pick? So for the same, same reason, the Cloud Native created a trail map where you can actually, if you haven't started, or if even if you have already started your Cloud Native um, path, you can revise uh, what are the main concerns and some of the options that you can take into consideration. For example, what are you using for your containerization, your CI CD solution, your orchestration? What are you doing for, or what are you using for your observability analysis or your server's mesh? What are you using for networking, for distributing databases? or for messaging. And on this regard, or I totally forgot about this one, the what, how are you running your container uh, during runtime, or how you're distributing your software. So I hope I gave you um, an overview of what you can go and look right now if you are thinking about the cloud native of where you want to review the tools that you're using in case you want to start using those suggested by the CNCF that are implementing the standards uh, are or using the best practices of the industry in that regard. This is for cloud native applications or you to go to the CNCF, either you look at the landscape or you go directly into the trail. Uh, if you are already um, 
I mean, introducing more testing, increasing the number of tests in the different categories of the pyramid or whatever is the structure that you use to represent the number of tests that you want to create for your project. I hope you, you give a second look or try the different uh, projects that I described, Wiremog, Rest Assured, Test Containers, because they are really good uh, projects and they will make your life easier. And again, for security, please, please, please start using uh, Frogbot, start using the IDEs, plugins, or start scanning your, your Docker images even before you start using them and any place of your life, uh, like the um, software development life cycle. And I hope um, you continue enjoying this conference. I love feedback. Please tell me what should I speak more about. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm always, always, always happy to interact and answer questions or discuss different ideas. So thank you very much. Please do scan that QR code and it will create a tweet and that does help me a lot. Thank you very much and see you soon.